So we're going to go into our first panel. And our first panel is going to be simulation in the academic setting. And I'd like to call up to this podium the Dr. Pamela Jeffries. Pamela Jeffries is currently the professor and dean of George Washington University School of Nursing. And I always joke, I say, Pam, you were the start of my career. It was your book that got me into simulation. So very proud to have you here. And so let's give a hand and welcome Dr. Pamela Jeffries. The current state of graduate education, I'm talking about mostly NP, and then I'll talk a little bit about CRNAs at the end. But what I've seen, I'm just going to, before I get into all these slides, what's going on with graduate education? It, to me, from a dean perspective, there's a traffic jam. We, we, we can't get enough sites. We have to pay for sites now. We need more qualified nurse practitioners, care providers out there, and we're very, very limited by our clinical education. Now, if you look at our clinical education that's precepted, it's, it's still the same old model, the same method that we've had for years and years and years without changing. So um, if, I, if you start, it's, it's, we need more of a sustainable model. Uh, there's a current shortage, as I said, and sometimes simulations are being used by MP programs, but there's not a lot of evidence how they're using them or the outcomes of how they're using them. And our accrediting body certification, they're still holding back a little bit, just to put it bluntly. How many are NPs in here, just so I see, nurse practitioners? So I think all, all of you that are nurse practitioners, I, I hope we can pave the way forward a little bit, and I'll, talk, I'll tell you more. So the background. Um, of course, simulations can be used for assessment, research, and teaching and all that. We already know, I'm singing to the choir, how simulation can provide a learning tool. And it's a strategy that can also help expand our learning opportunities in MP education. The significance, it's great just because of what I described. Uh, but many times we hold on, uh, for instance, in MP education, there's 500 clinical hours you have to get. That's according to the regulatory body. And the minimum sometimes on programs, and it varies across the U.S. on the program. Some have 504 hours, some have 600, some have in 700. But anything beyond 500, you can substitute simulations for. But many people don't know that. They just always say we can't use simulations to count in graduate programs. So that's false. That's not true. Um, but we, and many times when we're talking about simulations in graduate programs, NPs, they'll say, show me the evidence. And we went through this. In undergraduate program, I can tell you, before we uh, embarked on the NCSBN study back in 2014 when those results, reason uh, NCSBN did the study because in pre-licensure, the board regulators weren't moving the needle forward to allow us to count simulations in, in programs. Some, some states were, some states weren't. It, it was state dependent, but many of them were drawn a line in the sand, 25% can be used no more than 10%, we don't know. So it was all over the place till we got the evidence. And now there's some clear guidelines coming out from our board regulators. Unfortunately, now this is where we are with graduate education, that there's not enough evidence, there's needle doesn't move forward because we don't have evidence, there's no rigor out there. Um, yet many, many uh, MP programs and graduate programs are using simulations, which I applaud. So with this current state, with the shortages, uh, shortage of cl clinical preceptors that we compete with, with PAs, uh, interns, uh, hospitals uh, having the orientees with preceptors. We can't always get our own preceptors. Huge financial challenges, as I said. Uh, we've got to look at other ways. So um, if you look at the state of the science, if you get into the literature, which we have, it's sparse. There's not a lot in MP education. There's not a lot in graduate education. There's more in pre-licensure, and there is in medical education. But when you talk, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, I've been working with NOF, Mary Beth Bigley is the CEO, because I want to move the needle forward in graduate education. And NOF is part of that organizing body that we, uh, we need to work with and move forward. But anyway, when you look, you can see this, uh, some of the literature citing that we can assess and measure some competencies as associated with case management. Uh, there's been some SIMS on uh, differential diagnosis and also, of course, the interprofessional learning. So um, regulation, that's what I was quoting earlier. There are 500 
required direct patient care hours are required right now for MP and to set for certification. That's not going to change. Uh, when I'm wor working with NOF and when we talk, that's, that's not going to change. That, that We have to go beyond 500 hours. They worry about the number of clinical hours. So already we're going into this. This cannot change, okay? So you got that, that statement right there. Uh, but most programs require more than 500 uh, direct care hours. And it is similar to pre-licensure, depending on the school, how many hours are in your program. And quite truthfully, we don't know if 700 hours to prepare an MP is better than 600 hours, is better than 800 hours, better than 550. There's no evidence on that. We just set our hours because we think that's the right thing to do and that's what our graduates need. Same way with in pre-licensure program. It's all over the place too. When we did the NCSBN study, it was anywhere from 400 to 1600 hours to prepare an RM for a bachelor's. Same, what, who, is 800 better than 600 or 400? They're still setting for the boards and passing without uh, assessing performance. So, Competency-based education is, is coming about. I sit on, the, I go to the deans and directors meeting, the AACN, American Association of College and Nurses, and they are promoting competency-based education. That's gonna come out for graduate DMP education. I totally support that, that's not a problem. However, we, we're, not, we're not measuring competency-based nursing education right now. It's, that's not where we are, but that's the future where we're going. I feel simulation cases, as they've done in medical education, can measure these competencies. That's the platform, that's the mechanism, but it's not developed. We're uh, trying to set these competencies now. They convened a group, uh, AACN and others. Uh, there were 25 organizations that convened this group to come up with competencies. I want to, uh, this group, through AACN, these other organizations, they defined competency and competence. And you, I think you have these slides. If not, I'll be glad to share them. But you can see how, first of all, we got to agree on definition, right? And then how to measure it. What they came up with, this organization, there are common APR and doctoral level competencies. And they've gone right to doctoral level. If you, you probably already know by now, 2025, NOF, AACN, everybody else has said, we are moving master's NP to DMP. That's by 2025. So a lot of programs still have their master's programs for MPs, and others have done an integrated BS to DMP. Some have post-master's DMP. It's still all over the place, but by 2025 is the magical date. I am watchfully monitoring that. I'm just telling you as a dean, because what happens, the educational priorities are out here by 2025, but until the regulators, the certifying bodies, and policies change, it, they won't be in sync. They all have to be in sync by 2025 if that's gonna happen. So I know from a leadership perspective, I'm, I'm watching that. Because there's lots of evidence, and I'm not here to argue any of that. You know, master's prepared MPs are very viable. They're wonderful care providers. There's evidence on all that as, as we change. Um, anyway, if you look at the APRN, uh, there are uh, eight domains, and then there's competencies under each domain. So if you look and you count all these competencies, there's 29 competencies that an a APRN must do when we move to competency-based education. And the competencies, what they're projecting, will be measured at beginning level, at a time one, and then at the end of the program, time two. So we have a lot to do. Competencies have been declared. We don't have measurements for competencies. We don't even have competency-based education. So there's, there's smatterings of it, but it's not totally uh, there. So call to action. Um, and Kelly was at this last end of January, and several of you were in this. We had a call to action. I, I went with NOF from GW School of Nursing and NOF, and we had about 25 leaders come together because I, I wanted a call to action about MP clinical education. What are we doing? We're, we're, as I said, we're in a traffic jam. We can't move forward. Let's have a dialogue. And also, the call to action was to let people know simulations can be substituted after that 500 hours. That is still properly can be done. But the dialogue out, when I would go to conferences and externally, people would say, oh no, you can't use simulations in MP. Yeah, you can. They can count, and they, but it's beyond the 500 direct hours. So anyway, the summit looked at the effectiveness of simulation on MP uh, learning outcomes. We wanted a call to action, and 
we actually looked at a proposed research study, uh, rigorous. It was We got together, and that is still being worked on. But the outcomes of the summit, we too have a white paper coming out in JAAMP. It's all about the summit. You'll see who was there and the call to action uh, with that. At the summit, we looked at enablers and inhibitors uh, to allow NP uh, simulation in the MP uh, world. So very quickly, the top enablers were our learners. They're expecting the use of technology, simulations. Uh, it can be cost effective as you're trying to pay for size out here uh, later on. But we know sims are uh, costly as well, but we'll continue to look at ways to um, minimize those costs. The need, we already know the need for competency-based education. There's need standardization, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the inhibitors, uh, it's resources. It's equity across schools, faculty competency. Uh, Kelly touched on a little bit. She's doing a lot of faculty development. We have another uh, presentation on that. So you can see those enablers, inhibitors, those must be a, a addressed, I think, to move forward. So call for more evidence This came out of the summit. Uh, the time is right to see more evidence, uh, all, all much needed. But I must say, if we don't work with our regulatory bodies and our organizations, we're not going to move forward. That's part of it, I, 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 I say. So we have to be mindful of that. So recommendations, we're looking at new models of education, look at known frameworks, use standards, promote testing of the competencies. We should start looking at those competencies and how we test it, uh, that competency base. And the researchers, we should use consistent terminology and outcome measures so the research can grow. In fact, I was just telling Kelly this past week, had a graduate faculty think that INAXO's standards were only for pre-licensure that they weren't for any more than pre-licensure. We have to stop that. Where does that come from? And even when I'm dealing with the thought leaders think tank, in MP education, they want the MP population being tested, even though we've got some research on medical education and on pre-licensure, uh-uh, it's gotta be the graduate population. But of course, we can translate from those other bodies of literature, right? Anyway, in summary, uh, there's barriers, but barriers present an opportunity. I want to move forward because I'm running out of time, but CRNA group, uh, actually, I'm looking in here, Susie and Michelle and myself, we were, uh, we're tasked uh, to make, it's, we're on a research group for CRNAs, and they're looking at simulation for recertification. Kudos to CRNA. They're no nonsense. They're moving forward. They're looking at the mechanisms of, of simulation. And I'm not a CRNA, but I was so, um, <coughs> I, I'm, I'm so excited that they're looking at that mechanism, uh, so I'm joining that group. But, but they want to have a phase plan for implementing high uh, fidel, uh, human patient simulation as an alternative to testing. So there's a background. They have a council, a research council. They've had a pass-fail component, paper, pencil. But now they're going to look at simulations as an alternative way to uh, do simulations, uh, to, to recertify the, the folks that have been out for two years, one year in the CRNA uh, program. Uh, you can read more about it on their website. This is a lot of material. Um, even the, this bottom point here is the Association of Surgical. They've embraced the simulations also in the MOCA program. The MOCA is the Maintenance of Certification Anesthesia. So that group is way ahead using simulations. They're embracing it. I applaud that. CRNAs, of course, is part of our graduate education. So they've got a research plan. In fact, I see Janice here. We went to CMS, their Center for Medical Simulation, even pilot three of the simulations for recertification. This is their breakdown on testing. So they're moving it. And their attitude is, let's just try it. We're going we're gonna to evaluate. We're going to look at it. We'll get some evidence and, and move it forward using simulation. Uh, looking at a qualitative study, doing pilot testing. and. Um, Anyway, and what they say, our president graduate clinical, I'll just say overall, I gave you an example of MP, CRNA, our present situation faces ongoing challenges and requires new thinking. We have to content, stop doing the same thing we've always done and think we're going to get different answers because it's not going to work. So it's time to be bold, institute new models. With that, um, from our conference last year, 
and after working with Knopf, Dr. Pam Slavin Lee, she's our senior associate dean at uh, GW. She is an MP, but we have started what's called an MP consortium. There's the URL at the at the bottom. But their mission is to do collaborative work, get network, look at uh, research, test tools to do it together, do multi-site. You can read the, they're gonna identify gaps in the research and try to work on it. They're gonna inform best practices. They're gonna look at research priorities for the MP education. To me, this is important. It's gone outside the organization. It's not with NOF, it's not with AAMP, but it's a group of, um, researchers and educators that want to make a difference and what is needed is the evidence and the robustness of what's there. So feel free to go to that. Uh, the website's going to be open. They'll, they'll, you'll hear more about it, but it's a, it's a wonderful group. And lastly, I wanted to share in closing because I'm getting the time. Um, at GW, and this is a share not just for graduate educators, but we started a MOOC, a massive open online course. It's on Coursera. Coursera.org is seven modules, and many authors of the modules are right here uh, in this room. But it's for faculty development, and we already have, I think it's 1,200 participants from 20 countries. And I know at our school, we're using, I see Crystal Farina, our director, it, our faculty, it, it, they're required to go through it if they're using simulation. And all through se all seven modules, there's one on debriefing, there's one on evaluation, talked about the theory and that. So it's, a, it's very um, comprehensive, but they're just modules. So that's free, and, but if you want to download a statement of accomplishment, I think it's $49 or something uh, if people want the paper. So I'm going to end here. Of course, our goal is about optimal learning for quality patient care with our hospital group right here. And I'll stop here, and I know uh, there'll be questions after the, the, the whole panel. Yep. So thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Kim Lighton. She is the person I was saying traveled 13 hours from Qatar to be here today with us. Um, Kim is the executive director of the new ITCAN? ITCON. <laughs> Clinical Simulation and Innovation Center at Hamad Medical Corporation in Doha, Qatar. And her presentation is going to be, What If It Could Be Different? Love the title. <laughs> Let's welcome Dr. Kim Leighton. Um, and, and people always ask, what does ITCON mean? And it's an Arabic word that means excellence. So striving for excellence. So um, that's where we, we got that from. The, the title of this, I have no disclosures to make, but I do want to share that the title of this is borrowed from a friend of mine um, who has a coaching business. And this is the question that she asks all of her customers, whether they're individuals or whether they're organizations. So they come to her with their problems, right? And she said, well, what if it could be different? What would that look like and what do you need to do to get there? So what I'm going to share with you today is just some of the things that keep me up at night. You know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to level our scenarios to our students to make sure they're appropriate. You know, what do we include in pre-briefing? How do we debrief? What models do we use? How do we know if facilitators are competent or not? And, and how do we measure that? Um, can you learn as much through observation as you do when you participate in a simulation? How do you evaluate your scenarios? And, you know, most importantly, um, can simulation replace traditional clinical time? We've asked all of those questions, um, and we've come up with some great answers, but they're not filtering backwards, and I think that's a, a part that we're missing. So when we're looking at leveling our simulations to our students, do we put that same standard to our traditional clinical? And so when I think back about when I was a clinical instructor, I had the brand new students. They were my favorites, right? Everything is exciting for a brand new student. My clinical site was an orthopedic unit. And so my brand new students would have a patient who had fallen and broken their hip and laid on the floor for four days and had rhabdomyolysis and were getting um, dialysis. Seriously, they had been in school for two months. How can they possibly even begin to understand how to care for that patient? But I didn't have a choice. 
So clinical, you know, a lot of us just call it random learning opportunities because it's whoever is in the bed that day. And there's no leveling because you're, you don't have that, that ability. The person who has bilateral broken um, fracture of calcaneus, well, they're fractured because they jumped off of the three-story building in a suicide attempt. That is not the right patient for a brand new student to try to manage. So we're really challenged in that in our, our traditional clinical. And then do we ever talk about what to include in pre-conference? Do we have subject matter experts for post-conference? How do we even do post-conference? I know how I did it. I hated doing post-conference. So usually I found more things for the students to do on the unit, and we didn't have post-conference at all. Well, <laughs> at the time that seemed appropriate. Now, not so much. Um, do we look at psychological safety of our students in the hospital? Because we sure spend a lot of effort making sure that they're psychologically safe in the simulation. But then we send them out into the hospital environment, and we might not even see them for another two hours because we're busy with another student. How do we know that that student is psychologically safe? We don't. How do we evaluate clinical instructors and the preceptors? I was never evaluated as a clinical instructor by anyone other than my students. And we all know that that's just fraught with problems, right? Because if you're the nice clinical instructor who doesn't really you know, make sure they get their work done, everybody loves you. Um, Again, post-conference, we're, we're all over the place with that. We, we do it in random ways. So why don't we have to be trained to do that in the same way that we're trained to do debriefing? Um, can students learn as much during observation? One of the schools that I taught at we used a lot of observation time for clinical because there weren't enough patients available. There weren't enough clinical sites. It was a way to increase the number of students that could go to clinical that day. And how do we evaluate learners in clinical? How do we do that when we only see them for a, a snapshot of time during the day? How do we sign them off on all these clinical competencies when we're not around to see their performance? Um, so again, you know, can simulation replace clinical time? I, I'd say we're really looking at a much higher level, of a burden of proof for simulation than we do for the way we've always done it. So we have the, the National Council Simulation Study, which, which most of you in the room are familiar with. And in that study, it said that you can replace up to 50% of clinical under certain conditions. So faculty members formally trained in simulation pedagogy. Any of the clinical instructors in the room, were you ever formally trained in how to be a clinical instructor? Because I wasn't. And there was no orientation either. So you just go that day, and suddenly you're a clinical instructor. <laughs> Adequate number of faculty members to support the student learners. That's a, that's a given in simulation, right? But again, we go to the clinical, and you've got two students on the fourth floor. You've got three students on the fifth floor. You're going up and down the stairs all day long. You don't have an adequate number of faculty to really know what those students are doing. Um, I already mentioned subject matter expertise for debriefing. We don't do that for post-conference. Um, and equipment and supplies to create a realistic environment. That one's kind of a given. That's, that's pretty good in the hospital, right? So then when that study came out, many of us were really concerned. And, and it was a it was double-edged sword, right? We were really excited because it validated what we believed to be true. But then there was this big fear that people and schools that weren't ready to substitute clinical with simulation would do it anyway, because they're so strapped for clinical sites. And so um, Alexander and a group, um, including some people in this room, quickly came up with um, two checklists for guidelines, one for program preparation and one for faculty preparation. I'm not going to go through each of these, but you know, just um, in general, a plan for orienting simulation faculty to their roles. I, the schools I've worked at did not have a plan for orienting people to their clinical roles. They would say that they're orienting them, but they really didn't. There was no plan. You went and you followed somebody maybe one day, and then you had the group by yourself the next day. A needs assessment to determine what scenarios to use. We're really good at that in simulation. 
But again, when we go to the hospital, it's just random. It's whoever is there that day. Um, incorporating the INAXL standards of best practice for simulation, what are our standards of best practice for clinical? Do we have any? Right. Um, a faculty preparation checklist. Um, a tool needs to be used for evaluating the learning experience. When we go to clinical, we evaluate the students, and at the end of the clinical rotation, the students evaluate the clinical sites. At what point do the faculty, do the clinical instructors, evaluate the clinical sites? It's been my experience that the clinical sites are chosen initially because they'll provide good experiences for the students, but over time, it gets watered down because you you're, have more students that need to go to clinical, and so you just start adding clinical sites, whether they're really the best place for your students or not. Um, we, we want to have clear objectives and expected outcomes for each of our simulation-based experiences, and we spend a lot of time writing objectives and outcomes. I've never had a, a good objective for clinical. It's in the syllabus, don't get me wrong. It's in the syllabus, because it must be for accreditation purposes. But they're so global that you can't really evaluate per student if they're meeting those learning objectives for the day. Um, again, the debriefing um, and, and you know, looking at post-conference in the same way. The NLN came out with a white paper several years ago now about debriefing across the continuum. I mean, if you use a debriefing model in, in post-conference, then logic would tell you that that person needs to be trained in debriefing methodology as well. Um, the program collects and retains evaluation data regarding the effectiveness of the facilitator. We do that for simulation. But again, for traditional clinical, it's student evaluations of us. And then simulation-based faculty development with a focus on sim. Where do we go for faculty development to be a good clinical instructor? What conferences do we have for that? What journals do we have? What books do we have? There are some things out there without a doubt, but it's not a good concentrated effort like we're seeing with simulation. Now, when we do simulation research, there's a lot of things that we've tried to study, and we've been effective at various levels with all of them. I'm not going to read this list because you can, you can read it, and I'm running out of time. Um, but I, I sent an email out to my list of simulation people, and, and I got some responses back. And the question I had for them was, when, when you have your state board site visits or your accreditation visits, how are they addressing simulation? Because we've got the, the NCSBN, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, gave us a checklist. It's there. It's so easy, right? You go to the site. You go down the checklist. You say, do you do this? Do you have this? Let me see the, how this is done. And nobody's using the checklist. At least that's what the friends that, that answered me told me. And it was my gut feeling as well. So what I heard um, was... One state said their State Board of Nursing does use the NCSBA guidelines. Um, everybody else said that their states had no regulations at all surrounding simulation. And I know the state that I worked in last was the same way. They're like, you can do whatever you want, but if your NCLEX rates start to fall, we're going to blame it on simulation. <laughs> Great. No pressure. No pressure. Then the State Board of Nursing reports. Some states apparently don't even require a report. Other states' simulation is not addressed in the report. And others, they ask about the percentage only and the number of hours, but not effectiveness. Um, during site visits, um, there was one state where, the board, um, like I said, no site visits. They only rely on the national accreditation visit. Um, a couple other people said there were actually zero questions asked about simulation during their accreditation visits. Others visited the sim lab or didn't visit the sim lab, and they commented on how lovely the facilities are but asked no questions about how they were being used. It came down to numbers. It came down to hours and percentages and nothing about effectiveness. So my question to you is what if it could be different? So why are we not taking what we've learned in simulation 
and fundamentally trying to change the way we've always done it. Um, I'm, I'll tell you that um, Susie and a couple of other people and I have just finished a systematic review um, that looks at outcomes that are related to traditional clinical nursing education. And guess how many articles fit the criteria? How many research studies fit the criteria for inclusion in our systematic review? You guys are generous, because there were zero. We did not find one research study that had outcomes that were supported by the way that traditional clinical was done. So why do we keep doing it? And thinking about what Pam said, with 500 hours, somebody sat in a room and decided 500 was a magic number. But where's the support that says, during those 500 hours, we do X, Y, and Z, and that's why it's important to have 500 hours? So, you know, why do we just keep holding on to this teaching method that we can't support with the research or we don't support with the research? So, this is Isabel Hampton, and Isabel Hampton got a group of people together and her and her friends created the National League for Nursing. So then, Ms. Isabel got married and became Isabel Hampton Robb and got some more friends together and they created the American Nurses Association. And then Mildred Montag, I don't know, who's familiar with Mildred? Yeah, Mildred's awesome. Mildred wrote a dissertation that was the impetus for associate degree programs. Now, it didn't all work out the way that she had intended it to. Well, let's be clear on that. But one person, and presumably a dissertation committee, came up with a whole new way of teaching undergraduate nursing. And then we all know about Florence Nightingale. And she's attributed, I mean, one person, one person did all these things. They got their friends together to help them do it. So what I'm saying to you is that there's a, there's a lot of power in this room that can affect change. But we have to be able to move it out of this room and have a strategy for how to, to make this happen. So that's what keeps me awake at night. So our next presenter is Dr. Janice Palaganis, who is, she has multiple roles, Associate Professor of Interprofessional Studies at MGH Institute of Health Professions. She's also the Director of Education and Innovation Development for the Center for Medical Simulation. And last, Assistant Professor for Harvard Medical School Department of Anesthesia and Critical Pain Management, and also a newly inducted fellow into the Academy for Society for Simulation. Please welcome Dr. Janice Palaganis. All right, so this story started about 15 years ago um, when I was a PhD student. And so I'd like to draw your attention to the words here, interprofessional education, because to me, IPE connotes teamwork, it connotes collaboration more than two professions. And here I was getting my PhD in the School of Nursing, doing my research alone, doing all of, reading all of the literature alone, analyzing it alone, writing it alone, with the guidance of my beloved professors, who happen to also be nurses. And so even more, I um, publish this and um, I finish my, I graduate, and I get anointed, um, much as Kim has talked about being a clinical instructor, I get anointed to be this expert in IPE. I get asked to be doing keynotes in IPE, writing white papers, writing articles, publishing. And the paradox in all of this is that there's two types of IPE. There's formal and there's informal. And I think Kim referred to it as random learning activities, informal. So up until this point, that was all the experience I had, informal. I had never gone through formal IPE. The, uh, more, the, the bigger paradox is when I'd be at conferences looking at the other people presenting, they too have only had informal. When you look at articles that I knew by heart, they too only had informal. And so IPE is learning with, from, about each other, and a thought occurred to me that what if we brought a cadre of experts together? people from different specialties that were interested in getting their PhD, um, together learning with each other, 
maybe they're learning online or through different convenient uh, methodologies, and they're teaching each other, they're learning from and about each other, doing their research together, using best practices like simulation, analyzing their research together, and also writing it together and looking at it from their individual perspectives, their specialties, and publishing as first author of a paper, but with their team as co-authors in their own specialties. They go back to their own specialties, their institutions create their own interprofessional teams, and then they present all of their findings, they stay together, do their research together, network, bring their networks together. What if? So I went to a lot of funders, and it was George Tebow and Steve Schoenbaum from Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation who really kind of affirmed for me that I was on a good pathway. They put me in contact with Alex Johnson, who is the provost of MGHIHP, Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professions, which is the degree-granting uh, graduate program of MGH. Alex, along with Roger Edwards, listened to my pitch, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. And so here I am today. So I think the details of the PhD program is not as important as the philosophy, the philosophy that we've chosen to create our PhD program, which we're calling authentic education, and more importantly, the need for it and how we've done it. And um, I, you know, I've decided I'm going to just spend the rest of my time talking about this, um, what's on this slide here, because I think the PhD program that we've created is really just a product of innovation of what's on this slide here. And so I'd like to talk really about the why and the how. And so first I'd like to talk about authentic education. I really wish I had time to go around the room and ask what comes to mind when you think authentic education. If you have a QR code reader, please have it ready because I'll be giving you resources um, throughout the next few minutes. This right now is a poll, and I would still love to hear what comes to mind when you hear authentic education. For us to move forward in this talk, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what it means to me. So authentic education to me really means that we are creating education that is relevant to the individual, either past, present, or future, that incorporates all of the holistic nature of the competencies, if we can, as Pam was saying, agree on a definition of competencies, um, that includes not only the KSAOs, the knowledge, skills, attitudes, other, the behaviors, but also the social challenges of completing um, whatever that competency might be in a way where it is realistically applied, can be immediately applied, and can be sustained over time. So you might call it something different, and that's fine. What I want to talk about is the why and the how. So why is this important? Um, some, some of my colleagues already talked up on some of these bullet points here, and I know some of our other friends will be talking more in detail about some of these things. So I'm really just going to mention some of the themes as to why and give you some resources if in case you'd like to read more about it. So there's that thing called the education to practice gap, it still exists. It's still very vast in healthcare. Um, meaning, you know, just the other week I heard somebody say, oh, that's the way you were trained? Well, I'm going to teach you how to do it the real way. I heard that in the hospital setting. It's still being said. And that's amazing to me because you've now just dismissed $280,000 of student loans and years of work um, and training. And so, it's interesting because education and practice, they are infinitely intertwined. They cannot exist without the other. Practice can't exist without education. Education can't exist without practice. You can't dismiss either of those. The other thing is that what we teach is often not sustainable. So all of us have probably been part of a big rollout in your program. Um, so something like Team Steps, something of that sort. Some things might stick over time and be successful. Other things fall apart. And in my experience, when things fall apart, it means that we didn't have the right glue. Sometimes we, it was completely missing. Sometimes we don't even know what that glue is. The other thing is that IPE is inconveniently necessary. I say inconveniently because it is difficult to plan. Um, yet I'm really been, I've been pleased over the last decade to see the increasing attention on how important it is. I think we're starting to notice that it's a necessity, not a nicety, meaning teamwork. For our patients to be safe, we need to have teamwork and collaboration. And the precursor to that is IPE. So all of this puts a lot of burden on our educators of tomorrow. 
And we are posed with an additional problem in that our educators of tomorrow look nothing like our educators today or yesterday. They are going to be teaching things that, not the same things that we've been teaching all along. They are expected to, have, to do different roles, have different roles, um, all, of, all of these roles. And I think the good thing about this is that as simulationists, if you are in this room, you probably naturally already do a lot of these things because your interest is in technology, some of the abilities that we're gonna need to be future educators. What I do wanna point out is that we work with colleagues, other faculty that are not in this room, that don't swim the same circles that we do, that don't keep themselves updated on technology and how the new generation of learners are learning. They're the ones that we have to develop because we are essentially developing new educators of the future. And so they need to be able to practice and be exposed to some of this new technology and learning environments. And so the question then becomes how? How are we going to do this? And so I'm gonna to offer to you um, three steps, three, it's so easy, it makes sense, steps, yet we don't do them, steps. Um, this has kind of been my song over the last few years. Um, so these are like my verses. The chorus would be one simple word, it would be innovation. And so it goes a little bit like this. You practice what you preach, and as you're practicing, you figure out where your hypocrisy might be, and then you embrace that hypocrisy. Once you've figured out what that is, you use that as the compass to develop new education, which will be an innovative, it will be new. I think the best way to explain this is through examples. So um, over the last couple years, I've been developing a course called the Feedback Course that we offer at the Center for Medical Simulation. I have been practicing what I preach. It was probably one of the most difficult courses I've ever developed. Dan Raymer said I was going around like a punching bag because I would ask every single person to give me feedback because I wanted to understand what it was like to receive feedback. And then I would give feedback, miserably fail, then succeed, use the same techniques, miserably fail. Um, so it was very difficult, but in my practicing um, what I was about to preach in this course, I detected a lot of areas of hypocrisy. And so I'd like to share with you one area um, that, of hypocrisy that I detected um, in me. And um, this is a clip from a de giving feedback to debriefers. So some of you might know at the Center for Medical Simulation, we have a simulation instructor course. Part of that is giving feedback to the debriefers on their debriefing. This is a clip of me doing that. See if you can detect my hypocrisy. I heard throughout the recess event, event um, uh, pretty clear communication. And then you said, I wonder if all of you, if all of the members feel the same. Okay, for time, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Okay, so what I'm doing here is that I am basically telling the debriefer that she did not include her point of view in the debriefing. The, her, uh, the rest of the group really wanted to know how their performance went, and they wanted to know how she thought they did. And then I move on without telling her my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> and telling her how I thought she did. And so I'm watching this with my colleague, Sasha Mueller, um, because part of my practicing what I preach was I started pulling up videos of my own performance and asking my colleagues at CMS to give me some feedback. So he's faculty that teach with us in Australia. So we're watching this. The next clip, which I'm not gonna play, um, is me giving feedback uh, to one of the debriefers because he spent 10 minutes during the debriefing um, talking to one person and not bringing in the group, and what was I doing for 10 minutes as I'm giving him this feedback? I'm talking only to him. <laughs> so I'm like, Sasha, are you seeing this? He's like, yeah, you're a hypocrite. I'm like, I'm a hypocrite! And we're excited, not because I'm a hypocrite, because we're realizing something about feedback. And I was like, you know, it can't just be me. 
Um, so we start watching feedback uh, videos, debriefing of debriefings um, of other colleagues. And so sure enough, Jenny Rudolph, Robert Simon, Dan Raymer, I watched their videos. To me, they are the golden debriefers. And they too fall into what we call the hypocritical trap, a new phenomena that we've kind of discovered by practicing uh, what we preach. And so um, we've kind of embraced that hypocrisy and we've used it to leverage creation of new modules that we teach in the feedback course. Um, it's also prompted uh, a publication that we've just submitted called The Six Common Pitfalls of Feedback Conversations and also some exercises that we do just generally in all of our teaching. And so um, that's uh, kind of what we've done in terms of um, how to do authentic education. Now, I want to bring us back to the example, which I just think the PhD program is a product of an innovation. It's, it's just an example of this authentic education. Um, and I know I'm not talking about it in detail, and you might be interested in it. Um, and so here's some information if you are interested in it. What I really want to talk about is um, the PhD program has two tracks. It's got, actually it has three tracks, interprofessional education, healthcare simulation. It also has a track in leadership. These two tracks have more of that teamwork vision that I had described earlier. Um, but what I really want to point toward is where we are in the field. Um, and what prompted us to be developing this PhD program. And I'd like to talk about it through Schneider's four stages of a scientific discipline. So Schneider basically talks about how a scientific discipline matures over time. And it's just been real pleasure and privilege to watch IPE and simulation go from crawling to walking um, to a toddler stage to now what I would say more of like a teenage stage. What Schneider says though is that with every stage of maturity maturity for a scientific discipline, you need different characteristics and expertise for those leaders who are going to keep pushing it forward. So we may have leaders in the room right now that have pushed us to where we are today. For us to keep moving as a scientific discipline, we've got to create a new cadre of experts that have different skills, not just what we have discovered along the way, but different skills. And so that's really prompting us to create this PhD in health, uh, healthcare simulation. I open this to you now if you'll um, provide to me uh, and Susie and Walter Epic, who's also helping it, um, develop this program and um, hopefully other people in the room. What does authentic simulation education mean to you? This will be important to us as we shape annually this program um, going forward. And so if I can just highlight the challenges that I think Kim and Pam also highlighted um, and our, our friends here will highlight, continue to highlight throughout the day is we need to figure out what's real in practice and can be realistically applied. Bring that to education and in my mind, authentic education is one way to do that and to innovate to be able to do that. The problem is that we can't create authentic education if we are not authentic educators ourselves. And so we can all improve by practicing what we preach, being very deliberately developmental in our own profession, and then embracing our hypocrisy, and then working together as a group to figure out how we can fill those gaps. Thank you. All right, our next presenter is Dr. Tanya Schneider Ive. <laughs> Dr. Tanya Schneider Ive, who is the Associate Professor at the University of Maryland. She's also the Chief Executive Officer of Simple Simulation, which is her company, and founding member of uh, NOMP and former research chair for Inaxel. Uh, had the pleasure of presenting with her several times, so please welcome Dr. S Tanya Schneider. Ice. <laughs> Sorry. So as we all know, we have the Inaxel standards of best practice. So we have simulation design, outcomes and objectives, simulation enhanced interprofessional education, debriefing, SIM operations, participant evaluation, and professional integrity. The one I want to talk about today is facilitation, specifically criterion one, 
on the effective facilitator. So I want to talk a little bit about where this has come from. So we know that in order to be effective, we have to have helpful and thorough training in simulation pedagogy. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to reach the outcomes and objectives that we've set for those simulations. And we can eff effectively have poor outcomes. So I was wondering what faculty development meant. How do we know what we need to know in order to be effective educators? And so I talked with, I'm going to come closer now. <laughs> I tend to move, so I'm going to be still. I know. It's going to be tricky. So I talked with some sim leaders that I uh, had the fortune of, of meeting in 2015 about what, what do you need to know in simulation? What kinds of things are those parts of foundational knowledge? And we all came together and we, we came from different um, uh, educational settings and so we all had different experiences and we didn't have the same knowledge base. And we didn't realize that we didn't have the same knowledge base because we were all in a sim leader program, so we thought we did, and we didn't realize it until we started talking to one another. So, and through these conversations, we realized it wasn't the same. Um, as Pam spoke about earlier with these nurse practitioner simulation committees, they don't even know that there are axle standards of best practice that apply to them. They're the standard as, standards of best practice for simulation, not the standards of best practice for pre-licensure nurse simulation. Um, I am part of the Maryland Clinical Simulation Resource Consortium, and I'll speak about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But we have specifically outlined curricula, and so at that point, things started to come together for me and realizing that that wasn't something that everyone had. And then talking with standardized participants, when they would ask me, how much does it matter about the details of my character when it comes to portraying who I'm supposed to portray? Perhaps that has something to do with the role of the facilitator, the skill level of the facilitator, and whether or not they will be able to reach the outcomes based on what that scenario is about. So it really got me thinking, what do we need to know? How do we address that standard of best practice for facilitation? So criterion one states that simulation-based education requires a facilitator who has specific knowledge of simulation pedagogy. It goes on to say we acquire foundational knowledge through formal coursework and training, that we have targeted work with an experienced mentor, and that we participate in ongoing faculty development to strengthen our skill set. So I'm going to break these down a little bit. So acquires foundational knowledge through formal coursework and training. What's included as, in that foundational knowledge? What does formal coursework and training mean? There are um, organizations like the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, ANAXL, the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Those cost money to be members. Those cost money to be able to participate in, in their conferences. What happens if you're coming from an organization that doesn't have money to be able to send you to these places? How do you acquire this formal coursework and training? The National League for Nursing has the CERT courses, the Simulation Innovation Resource Center courses, that also cost money. So how do we provide this, again, for places that don't have that? So there are some states that have consortia that are grant funded. And I think to date there are about six of them. So six out of 50 states have the ability to support formal coursework. And so I'm going to highlight a couple of them. The first one is from Dr. Waxman's Neck of the Woods, the Bay Area Simulation Collaborative Model. And they have four levels, 
where they provide this formal coursework and training. So as you can see up there, the green level one and two, those are the novice and advanced beginner, where they provide two two-day workshops to educate on uh, the technical aspects of uh, what it means to, to run simulations. Then they go into level three, where they have more formalized apprenticeships. They address leadership, debriefing, uh, discipline-specific training. And then they move down to level four, where it's sustainability and this train-the-trainer model. We in Maryland have the Maryland Clinical Simulation Resource Consortium, long title, so we call it the MCSRC, where we have scaffolded levels of education. So we have simulation educator leader, simulation education leader one, two, and three. And so in level one, we have foundations, we teach theory, we teach about the standards of best practice, we teach about methodology. Then the next time they come back, the next semester, they go to SEL2, where they're competent. And we teach about curricular integration, how we purposefully put simulation into the curriculum. We give advanced debriefing workshops, and we talk about evaluation. And then SEL3s, is when we bring in leadership, scholarship, and prepare them to take certification to be a healthcare simulation educator. And then beyond that, we have sustainability where the SEL3s come back, they, they teach in the courses, they give talks, um, they lead journal clubs, so to create that mentorship model. The problem with the MCSRC is that in coming in as an SEL1 or an SEL2, you self-identify. So you may think, I've been running simulations for years, so I'm an SEL2. So you come in as an SEL2, you completely <laughs> miss the theories, standards, and the methods. So we've lost that ability to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So while the Bay Area and the MCSRC have some really nice ways of of delivering information that may be that foundational knowledge, it's not consistent. The second part of that first criterion is targeted work with an experienced mentor. What's an experienced mentor? What, what's experienced mean? Are we having mentors who are experienced simply because they've run simulations for years who are now going to mentor others in practicing ways that don't address the standards. But we're meeting a standard because they're working with an experienced mentor. So another example is from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So Dr. Penny Watts and Chad Epps have a tiered approach that they utilize to educate their faculty in simulation. And they include see if I can get this to work here, mentoring. And they define mentoring as taking place across all levels of expertise, maybe formal or informal. Developing simulationists are able to mentor those new to the field, whereas expert simulationists can mentor those who are developing. Okay? So you can see that they also have a scaffolded approach where they have apprenticeships for levels one and two, and then they move into three levels of simulation experts. And so simulation expert one, they have to design a course, and they have to get signed off by somebody who is a simulation expert three. Then when they move into expert two, they have to implement a course, and then they also have to facilitate 25 hours of simulation with that expert three. And then to become an expert three, they have to uh, implement three simulation courses and then have an additional 25 hours of, um, of integration of simulation. So while this is lovely as well, there's no consistency. And then there's the third part participates in ongoing faculty development to strengthen the skill set. What 
skill set are we strengthening? Because it's not consistent. It's not clearly identified. And this is also implying that we have opportunities for that advanced level to strengthen. Yet if you are able to attend conferences, you will find that the vast majority are targeted toward that beginning entry level person because that speaks to the masses. It doesn't speak to the little, the small number of advanced simulationists. But how are we to grow as advanced simulationists if we're not creating opportunities for advanced simulationists to advance? So I have a couple of thoughts. So perhaps we can have a standard in faculty development where we standardize the foundational knowledge, that we make sure that we include theory, that we're clear on the standards of best practice, that we know, as Dr. Layton spoke about, the NCSBN results and guidelines. The NCSBN, re NCSBN results did not show that we can substitute 50% of clinical with simulation. What they showed was if you have the aspects that duplicate the study and those pieces that Kim Layton broke down, then yes, you can substitute. But it's not a blanket statement. If you don't have people who are knowledgeable about simulation pedagogy, you cannot substitute. That we teach about debriefing frameworks, that we include evaluation. I, I question, can we provide recommendations for that scaffolding as facilitators gain skill? Should we require after two years that you be CHESI certified? Because that's the minimum, is you have to practice for two years before you can sit for the exam. Should that be a requirement? It costs money. Do we provide recommendations for advanced facilitators? Do we align our simulations with the skill of the facilitator, or are we just grateful that we've got somebody there who can debrief? Should the complex scenarios be debriefed by the more skilled educators? And then how much do those details matter? If, if my SP wants to know what their job is in the scenario, but the job really, their occupation, has no effect on the outcomes, does that matter as much? Does it matter for somebody who is a less skilled facilitator because they need to follow those rules if we go back to Benner? So perhaps it does. And again, what about development beyond that foundational knowledge? We have the Center for Medical Simulation where they do have an advanced course. But what about for the areas where we can reach the masses? What are we doing to support advanced facilitation? And so with that, I know we're going to have a discussion in a moment. And so, um, <laughs> but for now, we've got to identify what those essential components are for foundational knowledge. Otherwise, there's not going to be that consistency. And it's consistency that's going to, to create the evidence that we need to develop a standard of best practice. We need to identify how to best provide that faculty development so that we can have that consistent message. And it's imperative, it's imperative that we also consider how to provide advanced um, opportunities for those advanced simulation educators. And so, for me, that is all. Thank you very much. All right. At this time, I'd like to ask all of our presenters from the the simulation and academic setting to have a seat. And now audience, this is your turn. So we have microphones, people with the microphones, can you raise your hand? Okay, Mary and Wendy, one of our students. So please, if you have a question, um, raise your hand and we will bring the microphone to you. Again, if you would like to text, um, you can feel free to text a question, we will read those off. If your question is specific to a person, if you could put their name first and then your question, that would really help us. I'll start us off while hands are going up, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, thank you all for that, those wonderful presentations. It was really illuminating. And I think something that stood out to me, um, 
that crosses all the talks. This is really for anyone who wants to answer. The elephant in the room here is really the economics of education. And so what is being done to incentivize, for example, reaching the masses with our education as opposed to incentivizing us to create courses that by their nature might be more sustainable within an institution but won't necessarily reach as many people? I, I, I think one, can you hear me? I think one aspect is the MOOC. It's, it's free. So, and, and it, uh, of course, Dr. Jeffries can speak better to the MOOC, but, you know, that's one opportunity that we can reach the masses in a way that's economically um, okay. You've all been international probably on one occasion doing, I've been for simulation conferences. There's so much need, we, it's, it's hard to get started. And it's not just international, there's places here in the U.S. as well. Uh, what Tanya said, there's pockets that's, someone's never even heard of the nine axle standards or QS competencies. It's just always amazing. So it was, it was developed for that purpose, globally, free, to help the masses. I think another opportunity we have is um, to, to partner up with other concerned parties like the patient safety people and, um, and join forces. Like there's some organizations like IHI that I didn't even hear, I'd never heard of them until I went to my current job. And, and they're, all, they're all over, they've been doing great work for a long time. But, but those, that's another group of people that has a really invested interest in safe patient outcomes. So I think we have to also stop trying to do this alone and we need to, to collaborate with the right people and then pool resources. Um, for me, I think it's disseminating the knowledge. I, I, if there's anything that I did learn when um, we were piloting the accreditation program, so I was, um, as the implementing director, was going on every site visit. And it would be so interesting to go to one simulation center and then go to the next and realize that the weakness of one was the strength of the other. And there's no way for them to even be talking. And so I think it's the dissemination of knowledge. And luckily, we've got these bigger bodies that do do accreditation and other things that are aware of it and are able to network. So I think having, you know, just being out there and disseminating your knowledge and uh, being part of the efforts. I would like to say that there is a new article out by Mancini et al., and I want to say it's in JNE, that has a really pithy quote at the end of it. They, they studied four schools of nursing in the state of Texas and looked at, um, it's, a, it's a nice research study, and the, the, the bottom line is, is that the, the pithy quote is, we need to stop holding on to ours. It's really the quality of what is happening. And that, of course, opens the can of worms that we have heard here. So just look for that. Mancini's the lead author, and it was very, very well done. And you'll know the quote when you read it, because I said, molar cooler. Dr. Layton, are you doing research currently with bringing debriefing to clinical education? Am I personally? No. Um, because I've now moved into the hospital-based side of, of clinical. And in my previous position um, was also not um, with a research institute. So I worked for a, a school whose primary focus was on teaching, and they didn't have a research focus. So most of my work is done with um, instrument development, because I can do that from home without a lab. But how about the rest of you? I'm waiting for Pam to jump in. Mm -hmm. I, can we clarify the question that if we're we doing research and bringing debriefing Like using to the debriefing from simulation in clinical, mm -hmm. actual post-conference, like having a standardized post-conference, like simulation. I, I, <laughs> if I'm understanding the question right, I, I think if you are debriefing in, in simulations, plus you've got a clinical group over on the hospital side or in a healthcare organization, some of those skill sets will automatically transfer. They should, you know, if you use advocacy inquiry type methodology, I'm gonna probably use the same thing in post-conference or trying to get information from my students. 
and that's a good thing. I know when we've started simulations, I used to think everybody had to be trained to do simulation. Now I'm more on training teams. You have a team to deliver simulations, and the idea would be your clinical faculty would come in with the team doing the simulations. However, those clinical faculty start picking up traits. They, they start picking up uh, good skill sets when they observe, and then they can finally be immersed. But I do think they take it back unintentionally, or it could be intentional. Okay. I, I'd like to point you towards, um, uh, I have a podcast called DJ Simulationista Sup with Dan Raymer, and we <laughs> interviewed Jen Arnold, who does a lot of research on hot and cold debriefing in the clinical setting. And um, it's just so interesting because we talk about how the debriefing skills that we are gaining in healthcare simulation is far more skilled than debriefings in the clinical setting as they had existed before simulation. Um, and so we're seeing, I, I just think that debriefing is going to be the most translatable um, skill coming from healthcare simulation that's going to enter into the clinical practice. And I, I'm going to thank you for the idea because now I'm sitting mm -hmm. here thinking mm -hmm. of some things I need to do when I get home. It, it actually <laughs> is a pilot study that I'm running for my pre-dissertation um, experience. I'm looking at debriefing, um, formal debriefing along with active learning exercises um, in post-conference and having a standardized set post-conference for a pediatric clinical rotation. Unfortunately, our school only has five clinical days in pediatrics, so it limits the post-conference experience. Um, and again, with it being a, um, a small study and a pilot study, I just chose to look at knowledge and satisfaction right now, but it is something I was considering for my dissertation um, or for future research. So I think with, with, with only five pediatric clinical days, that gives yeah. you an opportunity to compare it directly with simulation mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that that's an interesting study. I wish you luck. Uh, Thank you. I want to also cue you into uh, the work of a friend of many in this room, Chris Dreyfus. I recently heard her speak about a pilot study where she was using an app actually to have to track reflection. Mm -hmm. Her um, study group was newly graduated nurses who were then moving on to the clinical environment. But there's a lot of parallels to what you're describing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. All right, these are questions from the audience. So for Dr. Jeffries, what would we focus on with, in regards to research for using simulation for MP education? What would I focus on for MP education? For research. What's that? For research. For research? Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, any type of research, adding to the database, the, adding to the science, adding to the, our knowledge base is important. Even small studies, because there's there's just a, it's there's sparse. It's not out there, and many many faculty will say, "I need the evidence." They're not going to move forward. And I always say, "Well, let's create the evidence because it's not out there." I think ideally, you've got these 29 competencies. If and I do believe evaluation and testing of those competencies will, will should be could be in simulation, and how do we set up good scenarios to test these? 29 competencies. It's eight dimensions with these competencies. One's on diagnostic reasoning. We know all NPs need diagnostic reasoning. What is, what is the best way to assess that performance to ensure even before they go in, out, and, and work with preceptors? It's, it's just a roulette wheel now how we're doing it. So I think competencies is one. Not all 29 at once, but very focused. Just pick one and get a model, then the model can be replicated. That's where I would start. Second question for Dr. Jeffries. What are me in the hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are best practice guidelines regarding simulation for summative assessment of NP students? Mm. What are the best practice and guidelines? That's all over the place too. That's the problem. It's mm -hmm. the tools. And that's one reason I think when you've got this NP consortium, they're talking about that. I mean, there may be good tools in, in Delaware, in Rochester, in different places, but a lot of people, we don't know about that. 
So can we come together? Who's, who's, who's got good tools? And then we can, can you generalize the use of those tools and get multi-site data? But right now, the, this is what we're struggling with. We were trying to write a study. Uh, it, was, it was a really just a straw man, a prototype for a study. But it was the measurement, the metrics on looking at any of those dimensions, particularly diagnostic reasoning on getting a good method of that. And even if you want to send students into simulation, say you got a multi-site study and you want to put them in a sim to see if they can assess and conduct diagnostic reasoning, then you got all this whole another variable called inter-rater reliability across these sites and how are you going to evaluate it. So it, it just snowballs the the issues. I don't think any are insurmountable, and that's one reason why um, some are using virtual simulations because they can be graded. You don't have to worry about inter-rated reliability. It's already been standardized, so then people get scores. Uh, iHuman is one. So you can look, look at some of that diagnostic reasoning there, but, but it's virtual. I think another important consideration is that you, it's, it's hard sometimes to bring students in for summative simulations when they haven't participated in formative simulations and when they're not familiar with the environment. And so it's really important to have some of those experiences before summative occurs. I, I think another thing to think about when we're doing summative evaluations, I get asked a lot by when I go do initial consulting for places, they're just getting started with simulation, and they're like, now how do we do summative evaluation with our students? And I'm like, you don't. <laughs> because you don't know how to be a good facilitator yet. So if you're not a good facilitator, then does the student fail because they didn't perform well, or do they fail because you didn't perform well? Mm -hmm. And so until you're really good at what you're doing as a facilitator, you have to really think carefully about how you evaluate and what the consequences are of that evaluation. And can I just say also when you're asking about where, where do you start here in the MP education world, even just standardized scenarios, three versions of a standardized scenario that's going to test diagnostic reasoning would be helpful because even the scenarios out there may not be relevant, may not be accurate. Uh, so that's a, that's a whole other area that we've got to look at. Much, much to do, but can be done. I have one more thing um, to add to this, actually two more things. The first is um, don't do it yourself. You have groups within your institutions that do assessments and so, and it's a whole science in itself. So involve them to make sure you're doing it right. The second is in our experience with the high stakes assessment um, with the National League for Nursing, um, which was a proof of concept, can you use it to say whether or not students graduate? Um, what we found was you can't see what people are thinking. And so if you are gonna do it, build in at the end a report where they have to report out so that you can ask them what they were thinking. I think in relationship to that, um, to just alert people to the National League for Nursing published what we call fair testing guidelines that I would pay attention to on the website. It was originally crafted around um, the notion of the high stakes um, objective tests that were coming on the market. And, um, you know, the premise of it is that um, students need to have been um, provided with that context before they're moved into a high stakes situation, whether it's on a paper pencil or a, um, a simulation. So I, I think in the litigious society that we live in, I think it behooves us to make sure that we have policies in our educational programs that really address fair testing across the board. So I just want to alert you to that. <coughs> For Dr. Leeson, Le um, I'm not sure this question. So do you recommend education for clinical instructors, or do you have recommendations for educating clinical instructors? Yeah, isn't that a great question? Um, <laughs> so I have a master's in nursing education. I, I was not taught how to teach. So if we have a master's in nursing education, it would seem logical to me that I would have been taught how to be a clinical instructor 
I would have taught how to be a classroom instructor, how to be a, a skills lab instructor, and how to be a simulation instructor. I was taught none of those things. I was taught, um, I was also not taught how to write learning objectives. Mm -hmm. I, and then I look back, I'm like, what was I taught? What did I learn? <laughs> really, I learned nothing that was of future value to me or my students. And so I, I think, you know, for those of you who teach in Masters of Nursing Education programs or know people who do, it's we're not teaching things that are applicable, that we can walk out the door and put to good use. I wasn't taught how to evaluate. I, I really have to go back and look back at my program because I'm sitting here not remembering what I was taught and that is a shame. And so when we teach K through 12 people, teachers, they have to have a student teaching experience, right? It's a semester long and they learn how to teach kindergartners and they learn how to teach third graders and they learn how to do lesson plans for a whole semester. And mm -hmm. so we're teaching our K through 12 teachers how to teach, but we're not teaching our college level teachers how to teach. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a huge gap. May I add to that though? This is very provocative. So in our whole profession though, nursing education kind of goes by the wayside. If, if you look at preparing our masters, there are some masters in education. You just gave, you know, what, what's standard in masters education. I did have some formal, curriculum courses and evaluation, but I, didn't, I don't have a master's in education. <laughs> but it was interesting, but that was back in the day. Um, but if you look at DMP role, it's that for the doctorate is quality improvement, evidence-based practice. And according to the guidelines, we're not supposed to have educational tracks on that mm -hmm. if you get accredited through AACN. You can have, they can take a certificate on the site or whatever, but you know, many DMPs come in to the academe uh, to teach our NP courses yeah. and all that. Then you got the PhD, discovering new knowledge. Many universities don't want educational research to focus on that because they want more of the behavioral and all of that because of the NIH funding. It's, it has to do with funding. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't prepare and add to the body of science in nursing education, then, then we're left out. But who's supposed to do that if we're not allowing that in the PhD or the DMP? And then a master's is usually clinically, it's, it's the NP or um, leadership, things like that. But usually we're not preparing them to be an educator, except the master's in education, but that's not standardized, as you just said. So it's kind of lost, it, it really is lost. And many of our nurses, one last point, nurses come in to teach in the academy, they're clinicians, they're wonderful clinicians on the, in the healthcare organization, they've never been uh, taught how to teach like any of us mm -hmm. either but and it sounds easy but we all know it's not easy and there is it's, it's, it's a it's a challenge that's kind of the state that we are in and, and it stands to reason right because if you're a good bedside nurse what's the next step in your career you're the charge nurse you're not trained how to be the charge nurse and if you're a good charge nurse you get to be the nurse manager Hey, if you're a good nurse manager, you get to be the supervisor. I, my personal trajectory down that path was a massive fail. I was not a good manager. <laughs> and, and when you look back on that, why would I have been? I didn't know anything about how to be a manager. I was never taught. I was never shown. I didn't have good role models to aspire to. I was a great bedside nurse in the ER. That didn't make me a good manager on med surge. And then we take our good nurses and we say, oh, you should teach. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'll teach. <laughs> Is somebody gonna show me how? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> no, we're not. It's a mess. <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight Maybe it's a hypocrisy, you know, we're talking about assessment of our students. Um, in the uh, current edition of the Simulation and Healthcare Journal, there is an article that highlights a, a survey of all of the summative assessment practices for simulation fellowships. Also sort of speaking to the, you know, uh, the people who ultimately are doing the training and what are we doing for them. It's, it's in this, this month's issue. Which journal? Simulation and Healthcare. Great. Oh, I saw that. Do we have time for yeah, another question? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, my name is Beth Latimer. Thank you so much for this great discussion and presentation. I was just wondering if we could.
talk just a little bit more before we close to figure out or to just get some more comments on really inserting sort of that ongoing development, meeting that facilitator standard into the everyday operations of our centers and how you hold the place for that development and building a community of practice into what's expected, that it's not, you know, your volunteer hours outside of work that you do your development in, but being able to figure out ways or strategies to fold that in and have the built-in time, resources, some of which are economical, but others are uh, cultural, that mm -hmm. there's a culture where we're all learners just as students are, that you can maybe facilitate people embracing development as part of their everyday in the flow of simulation. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a big barrier to make time for that. I think Thanks. that uh, is really important that the leadership recognizes the importance of faculty development, and so I'm, I'm gonna punt it down the row. Uh, <laughs> I have a little bit of a bias in, in that, you know, I've just launched this feedback course, but I think creating a feedback culture is one very um, powerful way that you can do on a daily basis growing people through the random learning experiences and simulation. We've been doing some work with trying to help leaders understand what is required to have a successful simulation program. Um, there's a, an instrument for simulation culture organizational readiness. There's also a manuscript that will hopefully get accepted. Um, because you know, we all go home from our conferences with all these great ideas. But I've personally worked for a couple leaders who just, they didn't appreciate what was done in simulation, nor did they desire to learn. They were great at buying the equipment, but then it stopped there. They expected, I mean, I learned on, you know, every Saturday coming in and figuring it out myself. That model hasn't changed, and that was, you know, 15 more years ago. And so I think until we can really help our leaders understand what all is required to be successful. So that's one of my missions right now is to try to, to get up and, and find out who those people are and how to mass educate at that level. I also, um, it is about leader, it starts with the leaders. If they don't understand about simulation and the needs and the resources, and you're right, deans and directors in the past, they thought it was great if we got money for a mannequin, and there you go, we're gonna start a sim center, and here we are. Uh, not knowing the faculty development was the biggest part. You, you, don't, you don't even need a mannequin to get started. It's about the pedagogy. It's not about the mannequin. But uh, anytime I'm in front of deans or directors, I, wanna, I, I try to say what is needed because I've been in this space. I understand it, and it is about personnel and staff. And usually you get your return on investment just hiring a sim ops or a sim technologist because you're decreasing the amount of warranties you're paying or repairs, they're just worth their weight in gold. But we just need to do a better job of recognizing what's needed for a quality sim center. In addition, um, and Sue's here, I participate in the NLN simulator, simulation leaders group, and usually we would take 20. But we would also, many times there's, there was a one woman, one man sim team, just one person trying to make a difference in an entire school with 300 students or whatever, and one personnel. So part of the leadership at the time, I'm not sure what the curriculum looks like now, but it was trying to have a voice, write a proposal, what you need, get data. I can do this much more if I had two other personnel, what these roles were. This is the return on investment. It was like a business plan. So that's really needed to have a voice and uh, make sure what leaders need to know to have a quality sim center. I think one other aspect that I would add is break down the standards and look at what, what do I need in order to, to function at the level of the standards. And then take that information back to leadership and say, we know that if we don't practice by the standards, we are setting our students up for poor learning outcomes. And so here's what we need to do to get our, our institution up to standard. So I'd like to throw something in. We have a nice room full of people here. And one of the things that's missing is 
our AACN and NLN and ASIN people are not being held, well, they're little feeties to the fire to ask the questions that need to be asked when they come and accredit mm -hmm. your schools. So one of the things that we could all, I challenge us to do, is send an email or call our accrediting agencies and say, ask, why are you not asking any questions about simulation as we use more and more of it? Um, what, how do we know what is happening in those simulation centers? Um, why aren't you asking these questions? Why aren't you asking them about the two checklists that are available that have been out for how many years now? Just ask the questions so that they know that this is on somebody's radar. So that's a simple thing to do when we go home. And really, we want them to do that, right? We, we want them to, hold, to then hold us accountable because it will help us get funding that we needed. It will help us further develop the standards, and it will help the learner outcomes, which will then help safer patient care. I mean, it just, it's just, uh, it's, it drives everything. But if we don't have that accountability at the very beginning, everybody's just gonna continue to do whatever they, they feel is best. All right. Thank you to our simulation academic setting.